Good afternoon and welcome to our Grow Native webinar, Soft Landings, providing year-round sanctuary for pollinators with Paula Diaz. My name is Haley Howard and I am the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. I wanna thank you all for joining us today for this webinar. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put those in the Q&A section on your screen. And at the end, I will read those out to Paula. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with you all tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during this presentation and the Q&A session. And now for some background on Paula. Paula is a veteran native plant landscaper who has been a longtime volunteer for the Missouri Prairie Foundation, the Grow Native Program, and Deep Roots KC. Paula has also provided in-person and virtual pr presentations related to human spaces impact on non-human species to groups large and small, young and not so young, including MU Extension Master Gardeners, Department of Conservation, and even HOAs. Education on how to benefit our ecosystem is Paula's passion. We are happy to have Paula here today to teach us about the wonderful benefits of adding soft landings to our landscapes. And now I'll hand it over to Paula. Thanks, Haley. Hello, everybody. Hope you can hear well enough. Um, if not, let Haley know and she'll let me know. But what we're going to talk about today is keeping on taking care of our pollinators throughout their entire, entire life cycle. For those of you who are needing to get your continuing education, education credits, these are our three objectives that we're gonna work towards through the presentation. Hopefully those will be something you'll be able to say, yes, you understand that by the end of this. So I don't know about you all, but when I first heard the phrase soft landings, unless of course you have a financial background and then you think of something entirely different, this was ke what came to my mind. However, that's not what we're gonna talk about, unfortunately. This is the kind of soft landing that we need to talk about. This is the type of thing that Heather Holm has described as being so necessary for the creatures that we want to support in our own living spaces that we want to share with them. Heather has done incredible research on the bees and wasps in our environment. Um, you know, a lot of us start out with the gateway bug of the butterflies, and I am a butterfly fanatic, as you may notice from the things behind me in there. But the other bugs then begin to fascinate me once I started paying attention to everything around the butterfly portion of it. These are two charts that Heather has put together. And basically, it's showing us how we can complete that life cycle for the pollinators. It's not just about nectar. Um, here's a little bit closer one. Some of the things you'll notice, and you will get this when you receive the presentation uh, PowerPoint as an email. But some of the things that we don't often think about, landscape fabric. If anybody has ever found healthy soil under landscape fabric when you go to remove it, I'd like to talk to you because I never find anything healthy under there. So let's avoid the landscape fabric. And where are we gonna create these spaces? We're gonna create these spaces at the base of our keystone species. The keystone species on this list were put together by Dr. Doug Tallamy. If you know anything about insects and pollinators, hopefully you've read about Dr. Tallamy's work. But these are the counting numbers that he has had his grad students go out and count which types and how many species per plant are being supported. So the number one plant that we can plant to support pollinators isn't even milkweed, it's our native oak trees. Those are individual species that are supported. So native oaks support over 500 different types of Lepidoptera, which is the moths and butterflies. You don't need to memorize these numbers for anything and you'll get them when you get the PowerPoint, but it's kind of interesting to see these numbers for one type of plant. 
And why are these keystone species considered to be what we call now keystone species? Well, 90% of the food that the caterpillars need is produced by 14% of all the different plants that make up our ecosystem in our area here in the general Midwest region. Caterpillars are important because, you know, plants take the energy from the sun and then the caterpillars are the ones who basically take that energy from the plant and make it into something that can be consumable all the way up the chain of command there. So the caterpillars feed the birds because baby birds cannot eat sunflower seeds. And Dr. Talamy's students counted how many caterpillars it took to feed one clutch of four eggs of very small black cat chickadees for 14 days while they're inside the nest. And if you haven't read that number, it's six to 9,000 caterpillars for one group of four little black cat chickadees. So we need as many caterpillars as we can make. And these plants are what will make those caterpillars for us. We might think of this as what we oftentimes see at the base of some of the keystone species. But this is not what we're talking about. This is, sorry, it seems like my tags are not popping up right. But anyway, we're looking for green mulch. This is the kind of thing that we're looking at to be at the base of our keystone species. If you've got the space to do it and the aesthetic appreciation of that look, go for this. This is at a home that's probably multi-millions of dollars, the home itself and the land around it um, on the plaza area in Kansas City, Missouri. This is in my own backyard, a bunch of wild violets that are just gorgeous and support all different kinds of species that you can't imagine. I took out some of the photos of the small mason bees that just, they come out in May and lay their eggs and they just swarm over the violets. Um, something like the native columbine, and then you'll have something that jumps up later on. If we're talking about the beautiful butterflies, they are the only Lepidopteran species that migrates here in the Midwest. All those other butterflies, they figure out a way around winter. The monarchs are the lucky ones that get to haul off to sunny Mexico and stay a little bit warmer down there. So if the monarchs are the only ones that migrate, then what are all these other ones doing? Well, they find a way to be protected by a rolled up dead leaf or a whole bunch of dead leaves, or they hide under the bark of the trees where there's loose pieces of bark. Um, many of them overwinter as adults, many of them overwinter as caterpillars, and many of them will overwinter as a chrysalis such as this. Would you know if you saw that, that it was something you needed to preserve and protect? Maybe not. These are some examples of the chrysalids that some of these species overwinter in. I mean, I'm really glad that we have a fireplace and lots of clothing because this would not get me through the winter. I don't know about you guys. It would definitely not get me through the winter. Um, it's just amazing to me the different creative ways that insects have of surviving. I mean, how on earth do they do that? They're all similar and yet totally different. This is an example of the tiger swallowtail chrysalis. So as you can see, this is not something you're gonna just be going out and cleaning up your garden and go, oh, whoa, wait, let me stop and make sure that I take care of this little piece of guy because most people are never gonna notice that that's a tiger swallowtail chrysalis. So they will never have that tiger swallowtail emerge in the springtime. Most moths, which are also in the same family Lepidoptera as the butterflies are. So they're just night flying butterflies. They spend their winter as a pupae in the ground, which means that they will burrow a hole into the soil and the leaf material. I'm trying very hard to eliminate the phrase leaf litter from my vocabulary because leaves are not litter. They are something that has always been utilized by mother nature to put nutrients and protection onto that soil. 
before we ever thought of a thing called mulch and decided to grind up a bunch of trees and spray them with whatever color we wanted them to be. You know, on that note, does anybody find a lot of health with the black mulch that's so trendy right now? I don't find it. I find a lot of unhealthy looking plants trying to survive the heat of that black mulch. I digress as usual. So we got to think about the soil. What else lives in that soil over winter? The bumblebees do. Many of us think about bees and think about honeybees, which Winnie the Pooh has a lot to answer for, for the fear that people have of bees because honeybees have a hive to defend. So they might come at you as a whole group and chase you until you jump in the pond. But bumblebees are not gonna do that. They're very gentle. They're simply not aggressive at all. In the cool mornings, go out and try to pet one. I've, I do it myself and my granddaughters do it. So it's not something that you're gonna get hurt by. But the bees spend their time in the soil. As you can see in this corner photo down here, that was when that little guy was diving down into those dead leaves. And I thought, what's he doing? And then I could see he went all the way down to the soil and they've got a nest under the soil where they lay the eggs for the next year's bees. But it's not thought of communally in the same way that a hive works all together. These bees will all die except for the queen. The queen is the only one that survives through the winter. So there's not gonna be a whole lot of energy expended making that space more amenable to the creatures that are overwintering there, unlike the honeybees who oftentimes use themselves up um, trying to keep the queen alive and keep the hive alive. I think I just already covered this unintentionally, but some of the details of it are, this one is a carpenter bee. You can see his shiny behind and going down into that soil, that's where they will spend the winter. They need those leaves for insulation. If we don't leave the leaves in place, they don't have any kind of insulation to get them through those cold, cold temperatures. And ideally it should be moist because those leaves will also hold some moisture typically if we have moisture for it to hold. Um, I noticed some really cracked earth last week when I was working outside and it was kind of sad to see how dry it was. So what would an ideal sanctuary look like for these Lepidopteran and bee friends that need to survive through the winter? You know, we, we plant so much for what they can eat, but eating is not all our life is about. It wouldn't be necessarily a bad thing, but you know, well, it doesn't end up that that's everything we need. We also need to have a safe place to spend our time when we're not at work. So that's what we humans think of as a sanctuary space. We think of, okay, we need something that's going to help us relax, rejuvenate, be able to do the hard things in life while we're protected otherwise. So if you are a bee, or a butterfly, or a moth, and you're looking for a wonderful home, this is not the one. There is absolutely nothing here that I can see except maybe some of the water from the fountain might give somebody a drink. But as far as the eye can see, there's nothing in this landscape that will really provide anything other than a bit of shelter for some birds maybe. It's like a food desert. There's no place for them to pull off and regenerate and get themselves ready for the next thing that they have to do. We might think, well, what if we put a circle around the tree or a bunch of soil, you know, make sure that soil is really up there. This is an older tree, so it'll probably make it, but I don't know if you guys can see behind the little box how deep the soil was over this one tree's trunk. And we have some shelter here, but there's nothing in here except for those who need the bare soil, but then there's no insulation at that point. 
So if we're going to do mulch and many, even, even the native plant plantings, if we're doing them in a space where we need to make certain that the neighbors can adjust and comprehend and hopefully learn to appreciate the aesthetic of what we're doing, I typically start out using mulch. Um, my goal is that by the third year, you won't need to add mulch unless you just want to do it as a top dressing for your own aesthetic purposes. But as far as maintaining the space or blocking out the weeds, you would ideally have a ground cover that will have filled in and taken over at that point so that you don't need the mulch. When I do use mulch, I only use pine straw now. Um, just with my research, it's about as ecologically thought about as the way that they harvest it so that they don't damage the environment um, as much as can be. I can't imagine buying mulch that live trees were cut down to make mulch from, which is what a lot of the cedars are. Um, but anyway, we, we need to think about how we use the mulch as well. It's just something that shouldn't become this hard, crusty surface. We don't want to make it so deep that not only do we kill that keystone species that we're talking about, but also we create that hard, crunchy surface and the totally unhealthy atmosphere in the center of that. I mean, you can tell by looking at this one, if you put a shovel to that, it's gonna be hard and crunchy. And the same with this one. Um, we don't need to mulch based on the color of the mulch. We need to mulch only as a weed preventative and kind of helps people who aren't familiar with their native plants if they're doing their own upkeep on them. It helps them also to kind of differentiate whether is this a plant I want to keep or is this a plant I want to get rid of until they begin to learn to identify the plants that they want to keep. And we don't need to put it deep. Three inches deep is plenty for any tree and anything deeper than that you're going to start cutting off oxygen and water supply to the roots and you'll see that starting with die off at the top of the tree. So don't touch your bark to the mulch make a big circle in there so you've got a skinny bagel is your goal. This is a wonderful human sanctuary. When we look at this, this has a beautiful large screen porch. There's a pool over on this side. It's a lovely window view out here to the trees and it provides, it's actually on the west side of a house so it provides some shade when we need it the most, but there's not a whole lot there to offer to the other creatures of the earth. There was a water runoff issue over here and there just wasn't much happening and she wanted something to happen. So our human sanctuary then became a creature sanctuary as well. It's a side of the yard that is not seen from the street. It's not utilized much by anybody who would be walking around, except now it is because there are all kinds of plants, all kinds of insects, even the robins were laying their eggs in their nest. So we now have a sanctuary that the humans can still enjoy, absolutely. And there are all kinds of creatures that can enjoy the sanctuary. This is another way we can work towards that sanctuary at the base of those keystone species. We don't, this, this couple actually is down to just mown paths. The lawn is no longer the default. It is now the pathway. So they have created spaces where they see all, you can't even imagine. And this is right in the middle of Lee Summit. You can't imagine the number of species that they find in their backyard now. And they have a place to overwinter because nobody's going to come and mow these areas. Nobody's going to come and suck up all the leaves or blow away all the leaves. You can do something where it's just a really informal planting. 
You've got your keystone species here, and there's all kinds of zizia, a red buckeye, even a lilac bush is better than nothing. Um, there's bluebells in the spring. Columbine is mixed in there. Um, there's some purple milkweed over in this area. So you've got something that gives you blooms in a sequence throughout the season. You don't end up with just the static looking at six inches of mulch all year. You get all different kinds of colors and blooms and movement and creatures because of that. This is one. Um, you can see that there's not much of anything. It's kind of like that food desert picture of the home all around. These are very, very large estate-sized lots and the homes are very high end. However, they had um, a lovely paver patio installed with a nice wall around it. And she decided to create a berm at the end of the yard. So there's a nice willow tree there. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but it's back behind there. Eventually it'll be big enough that this will be the basis for it. But this is pretty raucous, pretty wild and, and woolly looking. And yet there's hard edges and it's all mown around and the tree will provide the creatures who will utilize that space in addition to those that already have been utilizing it for the milkweed and the asters and all the different nectar and host plants. It will also provide space where they can spend the winter. This is an incredibly high-end home I could only dream of such a thing, but um, they created soft landings at the base of this oak. It's not all native plants, which would be my ideal and would be the creature's ideal. However, there's nobody who's gonna come in here driving a mower across compacting the soil. They can let the leaves stay within this defined area so that there's plenty of insulation for the creatures who might need to spend time there. Um, so it, it can be as formal as you want it to look. You can always choose plants that are extremely formal looking and are still native. And if you haven't seen those plants, check out the Grow Native website. Um, Deep Roots KC also has some plans on there. The ones on the Grow Native site were pretty much all designed by Scott Woodbury. Um, I think Nadia Navarrete Tindall did the edibles uh, portion of it. But for the most part, that's something that you can look up and get some plans pretty easily. Um, some of the components that you can use, this is just a bevy of Virginia bluebells here. Um, they're incredible spring bloomers. They bloom very early. You'll see all kinds of bees and butterflies utilizing the early nectar source. They're a great ground cover, but they are an ephemeral. So you'll have to think again about that sequence of bloom times. That's the key when you're looking at native plantings. You're not gonna have a knockout rose that's gonna bloom from May through December, depending upon freeze times, et cetera. But you look for a sequence of bloom times. So you start with the spring ephemerals. They come, they do their thing, they're gorgeous, they're wonderful, and then they totally disappear. And so the next thing you might have come up and be blooming is, I'm gonna to try to remember to say this the right way because they're changing the names to make them more appropriate. And my old brain sometimes goes to the old name first. Um, pink root is what this is being called now, Spigelia marilandica. Um, but it's one that'll come up and bloom later. It can very easily share the same space as the Virginia bluebells do. So you get those sequence of bloom times, you put in more plants in the same space because you're looking to have three or four plants cover that same space because you're looking for interest throughout the year without it necessarily being the same plant all year. Uh, Pacra obaveda is one that's always popular. It makes a wonderful ground cover in any kind of a shaded area. It will take just about anything you can throw at it. 
the foliage very often remains evergreen through the winter if it's not in a really harshly exposed space. Um, you can see it's there at the base of oak trees. It's just a lovely little plant and it will spread prolifically, but not super aggressively. So it's not something like um, an English ivy or a mint or something of that nature where you really have to worry about how aggressive it would spread. But it's a terrific little thing. And, you know, you can throw it in there as a one and done thing and just let it reproduce. Or you can intermingle other species with it and they will coexist just fine. This is the pussy toes. There's two different pussy toes that are easily available. Um, this is Antonaria parlinii, which loves to live in the shade. This patch is at the base of a pin oak tree. It's a mature tree, so you can see it's several feet wide and several feet around. Um, it started from, I think it was like three babies that started that one. So you can be patient and squeeze your pennies and let that reproduce by itself slowly, but not aggressively. And it really keeps almost all the weeds out. The only thing I typically have to do as far as um, removal in this particular bed is the aggressive trees that reproduce prolifically. And, you know, you'll just have to pull up a couple of those here and there, but it's not something that really lets much grow in between it. Um, there's also Antonaria neglecta. This is clay soil, super, super, super hard packed soil. Um, it was an existing home that was destroyed and reconstructed. And so there were mature trees to think about. And the compaction of the soil, I think, is going to be a long term issue. But these Antonaria neglecta will take just about anything you can throw at them. They are tough as nails. Um, the neglecta can also do fine in the shade. The parlinii that prefers the shade, it will not take the sun, in my experience. Of course, there's always different situations for everybody, but in my experience, that's the way they are. This will take just about anything. So if you're not sure, or if it's part shade, part sun, go with the neglecta, because as the neglecta reminds me, it doesn't take much to take care of it. And it'll have those same little white blooms that look like little kitten toes. Um, and it spreads nicely throughout wherever you place it, but um, it's not a super aggressive plant either. Um, this is a really informal grouping that you can see here. This was a really wet spot where a sump pump emptied out. And, you know, sometimes when people read the requirements for a rain garden, it gets a little overwhelming. Um, and my motto has always been that every bit of moisture that we retain in the soil instead of having it run off is a benefit. So even if you don't like dig down six inches and put in three inches of gravel and two and a half inches of sand and whatever else the criteria may be based on the square footage of the roof, do something to soak up that moisture that you know is already a problem. So this sump pump space got planted with a button bush, which super well soaks things up. Some ferns, some, um, it used to be called ageratum. Now they have a new name for it that I can't remember, but the common name is blue mist flower. Uh, there's some monkey flower in there. There's some skull cap in there. Uh, this other bed has the native hardy geranium. That's what this pink bloom is. Uh, the native clematis. There's some meadow rue in there. Um, I said clematis and I meant columbine. Sorry. But you can always do these mixes. You don't, you don't have to do all one plant. But if you want to, you can do all one plant. This is one of my favorites. It's Persicaria virginiana. It's called jump seed. Um, there's a cultivar that has multicolored leaves called painter's palette that you might be more familiar with if you're new to learning the natives. Um, this one has a much more solid leaf color as you can see. It'll get about knee high by late summer if you've had enough moisture. And then if you can see in this photo, you can see 
the spikes of little tiny blooms that it sends up. So it's really an attractive little bloom towards mid to late summer. Uh, you'll see all kinds of hummingbirds and the little teeny tiny bees and little teeny tiny flower flies and wasps and things using the, those blooms. So they're really something that they love the flavor of or the protein of or whatever it is they love them. Uh, and it forms this really lovely mat that there, again, I think in that space, there's really only some of the aggressive tree reseeders that I typically have to manage in that space. And then I haven't gotten a great photo of it, but typically if you have enough moisture, which I have a feeling this year will not happen, but it'll get this really beautiful russet red coloration to the foliage. So it's got multiple seasons of interest and it's a nice monochromatic look if that's what you would prefer. It's much more simple. And it's also one that's really easy to reproduce from seed. It has spread nice and aggressively in this space, but it's over a number of years. It hasn't done it anything super aggressively. Um, and there's very few pop-ups throughout the yard of this particular one. There are some that I'm noticing after years and years, but I don't see that this is really super aggressive as far as reseeding either. Sedges are a really big deal right now. Everybody wants to do sedges. Um, they can look really great. Pardon me. Sometimes it's an aesthetic that is a little more difficult for folks to get used to because it is the grass-like and yet it's not like turf grass. So some people love it, some people are not as keen on it. Um, this is all Pennsylvanica, if I remember correctly. This was all cedar, Pennsylvania cedar. Oh, Pennsylvania cedar, Pennsylvania sedge. So usually we do these webinars in the mornings and my brain has coffee in it, but today that's not the case. Sorry. But anyway, we have some Pennsylvania sedge. It gets a nice floppy hippie hair kind of look to it. Um, this is another space that's a very shady space and um, I'm not trying to promote a brand, but it is something that I get the seed from Prairie Moon Nursery, and it's one that um, if you have to fill in a space that needs to look like grass, and maybe the sedges doing plugs would be a little cost prohibitive for someone, try the sedge for, I think it's called Eco Grass. Um, it's real soft, 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 very fine bladed fescue. Um, that one really doesn't need mowing unless you have to keep the invasive tree species under control there. And then one of my absolute favorite plants in the native lines um, is the native wild hydrangea. It is one of the toughest things you will ever come across. I can't tell you how many people call a master gardener hotline and say, I bought this beautiful hydrangea last year and it was so beautiful and I've taken care of it so much and it's not blooming. Well, you know, we have so many different variables with the traditional hybridized hydrangeas. You know, there's the ones that are, you have lace cap and you have the snowball and you have the different shapes and different colors based on how much acid you've got, et cetera but they're also kind of finicky and they want to have plenty of moisture and some of them bloom only on new wood and some of them bloom only on old wood and so then you gotta if you how many people are your clients that can tell you what kind of hydrangea they planted that's not working there's very few that i find that kept the tag um so they don't really have a clue and so you start doing the experiment of, okay, cut back half of it and see what blooms and what doesn't bloom. And instead, you could use this wild hydrangea, which provides so much pollen. When we look at those big snowball balls of hydrangeas, those, they all have that large blossom. And this is the infertile blossoms that become large. Oh, you can't really see it. Hopefully on your own screens at home, you'll be able to make it large enough to see, but you'll have a few of these large blossoms dangling around 
the edges of the bloom from the wild hydrangeas. And so those are the infertile and all the rest of these are fertile. And if you can see the pollen sacs on this bumblebee and they move, you know, bumblebees are called bumblebees because they kind of just bumble around nice and slow, checking everything out, enjoying life. They are frantic on the wild hydrangeas. They're just like they're on crack or something. They're just zoom, 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 zoom. So that is a difference that you cannot ever reach with the other hydrangeas, the, the ones we are traditionally using. Um, the oak leaves, they are native in the eastern part of the country, so they do offer some nutrition. Um, but here in the Midwest, if you want the toughest plant you can find, I'm telling you, this hydrangea is it. I had a client that had a standard poodle that would run the fence line back and forth next to the public sidewalk. And she had started with tiny babies. The hydrangea just totally disappeared. Finally, third year, we blocked off that space with some of the emergency construction fencing stuff and allowed things to come through the soil that we didn't know if there was anything still there. And that hydrangea came up and bloomed and was healthy and happy. We hadn't seen it for three years in that space. So that's just one of those little stories of how tough these natives can be. And this is really a workhorse one. If you've got to fill in some larger spaces in a shady area, go for the native hydrangea. You can't beat it. Um, another one, this is an early bloomer, clove currant or golden currant. The reason it's called clove currant for its common name is because it has that spicy aroma that is just, oh, it's just wonderful. Instead of a forsythia, plant this because you can, I, I planted under bedroom windows because those days when it's starting to be warm enough and we want that fresh air coming in at night, if you have a clove currant blooming under that window, you can smell that spicy scent. The aroma is just wonderful. It's not intense. It's not cloying. It's just delicious. And it gets these yellow blooms that are just lovely. And then you get currant berries from them if you can beat the birds to them. So why not do this instead of forsythia? It's gorgeous. It'll take any kind of space, really, as long as it's not super, super like west facing sun hot it can really fill in a, a spot for you. And it's got lovely um, foliage as well. It's on nice ridges on its leaves and such. So this is another one that if you have, I can't believe I just really didn't give you much of a photo of the shrub itself, sorry. It's all about the caterpillars for me, I guess. But spice bush is another one that'll take that shady area in a, under those keystone species. It's another one that'll get pretty large unless you choose to trim it, which you can choose to trim it. It has very small, inconspicuous yellow blooms in the springtime that are quite cute. They, they're cute when you snip some and put them in a bouquet. Um, they're very small, but they're adorable and have nice aroma. Um, the foliage smells wonderful if you brush against it or crush it up. That's why it's called spice bush. Um, the roots also are very spicy. Uh, and you get the spice bush swallowtail caterpillar, which you'll find them rolled up like this, like a little taco in a leaf. And then when you unfold it, this is the cute little guy with the funny little eyes, thoughts that are supposed to make him look scary to birds. Um, that's the little guy you'll find inside that little taco. Wild violets. I showed you a picture of those earlier. Why do we believe these spray companies that tell us that these are weeds and we should get rid of them? I mean, you don't have to mow them. They stay green all summer without having to water them like you have to water turf grass. They will take quite a bit of foot traffic and they produce these gorgeous little blooms and they're so sweet for a little bouquet or for your first spring flower blossoms. The, mace, the small mason bees, the ones that you'll find in those bee hotels or the other places that you might make where you have those stems for them to fill up, they love this flower for their nectar while they're just packing it in there for their eggs. 
and we used to grow violets in greenhouses to give as gifts. And now we treat them as a weed and spray them to kill them. That's what a generation can change your mind from watching the commercials, I guess. Here are a few others that might be good for you to check out. Um, this is a combination again over here in this particular bed on the left hand side of the screen. Uh, this is wild ginger. This is some of the painter's palette at Persicaria, um, just because there is a relationship with a family named painter. So that's why that one remains. Uh, there's some of the Packer Obaveda. There's spider wart. There is, I think back in the back corner, we've got some of the um, pink root, the spigelia. Uh, this is shrubby St. John's wort. It makes a wonderful substitute for stinky boxwoods. It has small foliage that looks pretty formal. You can trim it if you choose to. It's not one that's going to get huge if you choose not to trim it, but it'll take that shady space at the base of your trees very well and be that mid-level for you. Uh, up here in the right-hand corner, we've got Penstemon digitalis. It's one that you can so easily add in even by seed because you have to think about all the tree roots when you're gonna go and plant something for a mature tree. Make sure you get small plugs or start from seed because otherwise you'll disturb the tree's roots. Uh, Monarda bradburiana is another one. It's an early spring bloomer. It will give you some really lovely color. It's beloved by hummingbirds and by butterflies and by bees. So it's an everybody loves it kind of a plant. Um, back to the hypericum, the shrubby St. John's wort. When those are blooming, those bright golden blooms, again, the bumblebees are just frantic to collect as fast as they can. It's, it's not their slow stroll like they usually do. So another thing we have to talk about is how do we manage this space once we create it? I try not to use the word maintenance, even though it's what pops into the brain most easily. And that's because maintenance to me implies that we want to keep the space the same in perpetuity. But what we really need to do is allow it to morph into what it should be. These are some of the garden magazines you'll see and what you don't see in these photos and in just about any photo that you look at in those magazines, um, unless it's a brand new planting, you will not find acres of mulch. We have this strange habit of making gardens of mulch and even different colors of mulch abutting one another. And very few plants are scattered in our gardens. We have mulch gardens and I didn't really get it. That's because I'm a plant nerd. But anyway, um, this I think is the absolute hardest thing for people to wrap their brains around. Leaving the leaves is crucial to be able to provide a full life cycle for all of the creatures that we are feeding with these keystone species. We have to leave the leaves. I showed you the pictures of those chrysalids. You would never notice that when you're cleaning up the leaves, whether you're raking or whether you're blowing them with hurricane force wind. Because 40, 170 miles per hour is that speed of the air. That That's a hurricane. That's a big, big hurricane, bigger than I believe. So we have to get past the leaves. My husband, it was hard for him. He comes from Central America. Every leaf is picked up instantly by the people who just keep everything in the park systems. And it was really hard for him. And so he always comes home. Our, our home come, has, we live in a circle, basically. Um, and so he always comes home the same way from work. So to appease him the first few years, I would mow the leaves on the side where he would come home and the other side was my side and it got to keep its leaves. The leaves aren't going to, you know, if turf grass is your number one important thing, then you'll have to figure out a way to gently move them. But otherwise, you got to make sure that those leaves stay there. They just, they have to be. If, if they're not there, then we're not going to have the insects. 
These are some of the early spring butterflies that you would typically see as your first ones. Um, for whatever reason in my yard, it's usually the red admiral is the first butterfly that I'll see having emerged. But this is what the leaf litter, leaf matter, sorry, I did it. The leaf matter is all about. You're not gonna look at these butterflies and notice them unless you know to look for them and notice them because they're the same, they're camouflaged. This is their place where they should be able to be safe is in the leaves. And if we don't leave those leaves, we don't allow them to live out their life cycle, whether it's an early emergent or an overwintering chrysalis or an overwintering caterpillar, all of these plants come up through all these deep oak leaves that you see here. The plants will not have a problem with the oak leaves or any leaves. You know, if you're exceeding six inches in depth, then you might need to gently rearrange things a bit. But overall, there's not gonna be a problem with them. And Heather's, Heather Holmes' research shows us that, you know, we've learned about, we need to cut things back in the spring when we feel the compulsion to clean things up. Leave 24 inches of stems, but you've gotta leave them for two years because that first year, the center of that stem is not dry enough for the creatures to get in there and use it. They need it to be dried well. So it has to be the second year that they can use the stems. Once your new growth comes up, you will never notice that those are there. And in many ways, it gives a little support to some of the ones that might otherwise be floppy. Um, there is a new transitional landscape plan made um, by Scott Woodbury. This is where you can find it. Again, don't worry about writing it down. You'll have it when you get the PowerPoint. Um, this is what it will look like. He plots out some very um, traditional looking, very formal looking plans. And this is one that you can be free to copy and access. Another way that we have to think about taking care of these spaces that are the soft landings we have to make them safe in all different manners. So just as a wake us up kind of a thing, this shows agricultural use of glyphosate in 1992. This shows the use of glyphosate in, and I can't see it behind that. There we go, 2016. So, quite significant increase, and that was quite a few years ago now. So if we're gonna spray the places where we're gonna have these creatures come, we're gonna end up killing the creatures that we wanted to have. Um, another kind of pollution we have to think about is the light pollution. A lot of people are utterly unaware that there is zero research that is not produced by a security alarm company or a police department showing any kind of benefit from leaving your lights on at night outdoors. At the very least, try to get some motion detector lights so that you don't end up with just lights on constantly. Because if we leave those lights on, the moths that are trying to find their mates, they're not developed to work in that kind of light. They're not going to find what they need to do. They have they have pheromones that they emit, but the light makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference on us humans as well, if you start doing any research into the light pollution, but we can't keep leaving every light on. We can't keep spraying every inch of our environment with the poisons that are meant to kill insects because they're going to kill the insects. We need to learn to mow when we need to mow rather than the calendar says today is the day to mow. I know people who water their lawns every single day. At one time, there was over 80% of the water in Johnson County, Kansas. Potable water, usable, drinkable water was used for watering lawns. It's something we need to set our minds that not everything has to be identical. Even if all the houses are a different color of beige, and I lived in one of those neighborhoods. 
with 120 some species of native plants and never got a complaint because you just, you gotta have the signage, you gotta have the hard borders, but you can do it. There are different types of beauty. Not all of these things will appeal to every single person, but these are all something that you're gonna find that is beautiful. And when we look at the usefulness, the purposefulness of what our plants can provide to these creatures who need us, then we can understand the beauty in something that looks not just barberries and boxwoods and daylilies and Bradford pear trees. We can see that there might be other benefits to having different kinds of plants that will provide different things at different times for us. And when it comes to how to take care of that space, my fallback is always, what would mother nature do? She didn't have anybody that came around and raked up all the leaves and took them away in a bag so that you could rebuy them as compost in the springtime. These are my two main sources for the research that I've done that looks at the soft landing idea. It's Heather Holm who came up with the name of soft landings for these spaces. And she does some terrific research. She's got some great books, great articles, definitely follow her. These are some great spots to find specific plants listed that you might be able to utilize. Um, this is a really nice list that'll give you bloom times, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, that's not something you'll try to read from here. Just enjoy reading that when you get it. So I guess we're ready for questions now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Paula. I've been furiously writing down all of your <laughs> ideas and very inspirational messages. So thank you. And we do have several questions, so we will go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, from Jay Hyde, uh, the question is, if I use cedar mulch under my trees as my native plants mature and grow together, am I counteracting the benefits of native ground covers and plants attracting native insects and pollinators? Well, one of the things that I have learned in life <laughs> is that there is ideal and there is reality, and they are not always the same thing. So we would propose the ideal, which would be that we would leave, you know, we wouldn't use pine straw either. We would use nothing. We would have already left these things. We would never have bulldozed every tree down to build our homes. So those are the ideals. And reality is what we can accomplish. Um, you know, I we can only do the best that we can do. And there's been so many parts of my life that have shown me that. So hopefully we strive to be the ideal and we accomplish what we are capable of accomplishing at this time. And maybe we'll change what we're doing in the future too. But right now we're doing what we're doing and every plant that feeds an insect or a bird or another creature of our environment is a betterment. All right. Thank you. And the next question is from Heather. Uh, she wanted to know if there is a resource that lists the specialist lipidoptera. Lipidoptera. Thank you. That are not fed by the top keystone plants. So if uh, she plants mostly keystone plants, what other plants should she add to the landscape? To augment the outliers. That. Um. There's a really great resource on the North American Butterfly Association. They have really great information on a lot of different host plants. Um, what are some of the other? Tellamy has, um, he focused originally almost exclusively on Lepidoptera. So if you go through his books, um, you know, the first one was Bringing Nature Home. And that one had a really good list of all the different host plants. And if you're in the Kansas City area, um, Betsy Betros has a Kansas City area specific butterfly book. Um, 
let's see, there's also a really good book from North American Butterfly Association. I'm trying to think of some of my favorite ones. I'm trying to glance here and cheat. Um, and if you want more of those, send me an email and I'll get you a list better than what I'm rattling off now. I think that sounds great. All right, your next question is from Karen. Uh, in uh, actually, a few people asked where you purchase your pine straw. Um, so in Kansas City, mm -hmm. I get it um, usually suburban. The big um, site in Martin City has it in stock. Sometimes Cat Nursery, K A T has it in stock. They are a wholesale nursery. But if you have an EIN or have someone who would loan you their EIN, you can purchase there. Um, and, you know, I've actually considered getting a shipment of a semi load of it just because it seems like almost all the people that I have used it on continue to prefer that to other mulch. I mean, it's, it stays in place better. It doesn't wash away with the rain. It doesn't blow away. It's It just allows so much more air movement and moisture movement through it and it doesn't form that crust that the wood mulch often does which then prevents anything from entering it so there are places you just kind of have to search sometimes all right thank and you the more you ask for it the more likely they'll be to start adding it so yes. definitely ask for it right Okay, the next question is from Judy. Uh, she said at her daughter's house in Virginia, she has beautiful mature trees. Uh, they are removing the English ivy, but there are areas that are eroded with exposed roots. And she wondered if it would be helpful to put down compost for these trees. And if so, perhaps how deep? And are there any concerns about where she should get the compost from? Hmm. Well, without seeing it, all I can give is generalized information. Um, my best guess kind of thing. So please don't take this as gospel in any way, shape or form. Um, sure, you could add some compost if there's erosion, but also, I mean, hey, look at Mother Nature's base there. Trees roots are meant to be at the surface. Um, trees do a thing that's called air root pruning. If you've ever seen a tree that's been blown up out of the soil from a storm, it doesn't have feet deep roots typically. You see a wide mesh of roots. So you've got to be cautious of how much soil or compost or mulch or anything else you add on top of those roots. And if those roots have been exposed for quite some time, then they're probably used to being exposed and you might do more harm than good adding very much of anything. You know, if you want to give them a little nutrient boost, especially after English ivy, um, you might sprinkle, you know, an inch or so of compost on there, but get planted the new things as fast as you can so that they can get their roots in there to hold that soil for you. The English ivy has very, very shallow roots. And that's why it doesn't hold something. But once you start getting the plants that will have deeper root system and help to hold that root, that soil in place, you'll do a much better job of ending the erosion going on. Great, thank you. All right, the next question is from Colin, um, who's trying to transition uh, their yard from grass to native plants, but is getting overwhelmed by all the info out there. <laughs> we have a yeah. great starting point for Colin. A great starting point is eat the elephant one bite at a time. <laughs> I, I have known people who, and I have had a client that she was like, no, go big or go home. I got to do it all. And I was like, okay, but I'm telling you now it's a mistake. And she's like, but that's what I'm telling you to do. Okay. <laughs> um, I usually advise people to start with a bed, create one bed and get that to where you understand it. You recognize the plants, you feel comfortable with it. And next year, move that boundary out a little bit and add some more plants. And the next year, move that boundary out a bit and add some more plants or add another bed. 
trying to do it whole hog is really difficult, especially if you're somebody that's not experienced already with the plants themselves. Because if you put the wrong plant in the wrong place, it's going to be unappealing to you. And if you have neighbors that you have to have not hate you <laughs> um, or call an HOA or a city on you, then the sometimes they can adapt with a gradualness to how you transform things as well. That's kind of one of the reasons the mulch is good at the beginning because it gives that gradual filling in and they don't usually stress out over it the way they would if you put in all 10 mature plants in one spot. And, you know, it, it gives people a chance to adjust and you a chance to learn. As far as resources, Grow Native is always gonna be my number one. Uh, the website is phenomenal, but there is an awful lot of stuff on there. And um, the designs are super helpful, but also be realizing that some of the plants that are listed are not going to be available to Joe Schmo going to the nursery. Um, and also some of the plants right now are really difficult to come by. We went for a couple of years where we were able to get, you know, mature size plants that looked so much better at a very first planting. And now we're back to tiny baby plugs because there's been such a great demand, which is both wonderful and annoying. So you just got to realize it's not necessarily, if you make up a plan or write down a plan, be adaptable, be ready to change. Great, thank you. Uh, Carolyn wondered if uh, you had any direct sunlight plant ideas. And I'm, I'm guessing this, she, she means for outside of your soft landings or in the transition, um, periods? I'm not sure. Yeah, um, some of the plants can take that sun until your tree becomes established. Um, some of the keystones that were on the list that were the non-tree species, those are definitely full sun plants. And so you're going to fill in around those forbs, the grasses and forbs. But um, typically we would be looking for at least partial shade plants, even with a new tree planting, because at some point that tree is going to grow and create its own shade. Um, you can always, you know, transition, let something die out because it no longer gets enough sun. But the hazard when you do that is that sometimes it begins to not be as aesthetically pleasing to us because they'll flop. They'll still try to grow, but they'll not be tall and erect like we would wish that they might look better. But as far as just a list of full sun plants that would be happy, again, Hit Grow Native website and you'll find everything you can imagine. Perfect, thank you. Val wondered, um, well, she says she loves the pussy toes, but won't they be buried uh, with leaves that will require removal? And nope. I think you showed that the, the plants kind of come up out of the leaves, right? Yep, they don't, they're not bothered by it at all. And leaves are not a static thing. They decompose, that's what they've always done. So if you think that it's gonna be a little bit too much, get out there and tromp around on them a little bit with your boots on and crunch them up a little bit and hope that you don't kill too many Lepidoptera when you do it. <laughs> but you know, if we, if we mulch the leaves, then we mulch the little critters that are living in those leaves too. So if you really must com feel so compelled that you have to do it, gently gently rake to some spot in your yard that's hopefully very close to where you're starting out because that was the space they chose to be safe in but i have never had a problem with pussy toes being unable to survive leaf mulch all right thank you next question is from michael um he said thank you and that he's loving all these tips from for his own home garden. 
Um, and he wondered, have there previously been any efforts to engage local and KC area governments in utilizing <laughs> more native plants in public spaces? Would be great to see more engaging sustain sustainable and locally relevant plantings of our city's extensive boulevards and greenways that are currently sitting there as useless monocultures. Being mowed and people risking their lives along the side of the road at a 90 degree angle to mow it. Yeah. Um, well, there is the Contain the Rain program in Johnson County, Kansas, that most of the municipalities participate in. And some of the Johnson County municipalities have made a great effort to use many, many, many native plants in their what streetscaping, I guess it's called. Um, the Kansas City Parks Department has a wonderful new, well, not, not new anymore, I guess it's been a couple of years, but uh, a former MDC guy has gone to the Casey Parks Department and is helping them try to revamp the parks plantings to be much more native plant oriented and sustainable. Um, there was a 10,000 rain gardens program quite some time ago that encouraged Kansas Cityans to plant rain gardens, but it hasn't been much of anything. Um, Kansas City, Missouri has signed the Mayor's Monarch Pledge, which is supposed to state that they're trying to eliminate pesticides and uh, monocultures and yeah, but again, Implementation of that is not seen very widely. So definitely contact your own representatives and encourage them to push that forward because it would be amazing. Right, yes. and I will just mention that Grow Native is in the process of developing a municipality toolkit for the Grow Native website that would potentially help uh, cities and, and maybe even, you know, concerned citizens could um, mention these resources as well. So thank you. The next question is from Cindy and she said her soft landing areas are covered in mostly oak leaves as long or she's trying to keep them covered in the leaves as long as she can in the spring but it gets so deep that it suffocates the plants in her flower bed and she just wondered when would be the time that she could remove them safely. There's always the question of <laughs> what, how, what is late enough to clean up? Right. Um, well, again, we are at ideal and reality. Ideal is never because the plants will figure it out or the right plants will figure it out. Uh, however, Many people aren't able to deal with that. And, you know, as far as timing, there are many specialist bees that don't even emerge until the plant on which they specialize is blooming. Right now, blue sage is blooming, the big, tall prairie sage. And that has a specialist bee called the blue sage bee. And that bee just recently became active when the blue sage began to bloom. So timing is again, ideal versus reality. Ideally, never, but if you need to, you know, sometimes if you add some shrubs, I don't know what plants you have under there, but sometimes if you add some shrubbery, so you've got that mid-level instead of only the ground level type of things, um, the shrubs can help to protect and divert some of those leaves a little bit. Um, oak trees do drop a ton of leaves, but eventually they decompose. So it's, it's again, you just got to do what's the best that you can accomplish. All right. Thank you. So um, someone anonymous, anonymously asked a few questions, and I think you already addressed about how you need to be careful under an established tree, right, with the roots. But um, they mentioned um, a mature maple being, uh, you know, depth of leaves several inches. And this 
kind of made, I think I've heard that maples are a little bit more challenging to, to grow under things underneath, but um, do you have any, um, yeah, so basically leave the leaves, right? And the natives will. That's the ideal. But will persevere. I've plant under a lot of maples. I mean, I have a lot of maples in my own yard mm -hmm. and honestly, I don't see that they are any more difficult. I mean, the pin oaks, those can be a challenge. I mean, it can, in certain areas, depending upon the wind and how things blow around, they can be a foot deep. And so, you know, sometimes I'll go in there and fluff them up, put my boots on and just go trek through there because I figure I may not be what I want to be size wise, but I'm still smaller than a bison. And these plants survived bison and antelope and all these other creatures that went tromping through every space there was. So, you know, ideal and real, we, we have to do what we can do. And if that is not something that can work for you, do the next best thing that you can do. All right. Um, do you, is the wild hydrangea, Beth wanted to know if that, how much shade the wild hydrangea needs. And I'm trying to think of how much sun it can take because it, it's right. definitely a shade plant. Um, I'm trying to think of any that I've, I just haven't planted any in sunny areas to know how much sun it could take. Pretty much everything I've planted in is at least high shady. It, you know, there's plenty of light surrounding, but it's not direct light and it's not going to penetrate at it. If you want to water it and give it that advantage, it might be able to take quite a bit more light, um, but it'll crisp up pretty quickly if it's getting too much light. All right, thank you. Um, question from Fire Tablet. I don't think that's the actual name. <laughs> but, uh, will Golden Current do well on the east side of a house? Yes, okay. it will. Perfect. Um, let's see. And then you'd mentioned the native shrubs, some native shrubs for part sun and part shade, uh, the shrubby St. John's wort. Um, Spice bush will take some sun. It prefers a fairly shaded area, but it'll take some sun. Just don't give it afternoon blazing sun in July. Give it an Eastern exposure if you can. Okay. All right. Gail, and it looks like we have quite a few more questions, maybe 10-ish, maybe more. <laughs> How are you doing on, uh, are you okay to continue? I'm fine. I'm solo Perfect. in the house, so. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so Megan wondered who is going to break the news to the municipalities that make it so convenient to pick up leaves by sweeping them from the curb. You yeah. would think they would take on a program to save their valuable resources. <laughs> you um, would think. One would hope, but uh, so often that's not the case. In fact, over in Johnson County, people can blow their leaves out into the street and then they have these big trucks that just come and suck them all up. So they don't even have to bag them up. Wow. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. And in it's other municipalities, big, it's illegal big, to do that into the street because it'll clog up the storm drains. So, yeah, it just depends where you live. That's true. Um, Deborah wanted to know if you leave, if she leaves the leaf stems for two years for the bees and others to use, will it be obvious which ones have been there for two years? Maybe. Uh, I mean, if you were really concerned about it, you could like color code them, I guess, you know, take a little spray can with you. But honestly, once you get in the habit of doing it, they're just part of that bed, part of that landscape. And you don't think about having to remove it. You just leave it. And the bees will know which ones are dry enough and which ones are not. And once you start leaving them, you'll you'll see that it's it's 
they're going to be covered up. You won't see them as soon as the stuff starts to grow again in the springtime. So it's not a huge deal to have to worry about. Okay. Thank you. And then um, one clarification on the pine straw. Do you mean, Carter wanted to know, do you mean pine needles or what? There, is There is a thing called pine straw. If okay. you've traveled in the southern states, you have seen it used everywhere. Mm -hmm. And what it actually is made of is very, very long pine needles. Okay. And they bale them up like a bale of straw. It's way lighter than an actual bale of straw would be. So I can carry it myself easily as opposed to barely dragging it along. Um, it's not wrapped in plastic. Sometimes they sell this thing that's called quick straw, which I am not a fan of. It comes wrapped entirely in plastic, which is one of the benefits of not buying bags of plastic and instead using pine straw is you don't have all the plastic. Um, it, it's just baled with twine and you untie the twine and take it out. It's, it's pretty compressed, so it comes out kind of like flakes, like if you were feeding hay to a horse and you were going to take a flake of hay out. Um, but it's real easy to use once you get used to it. You can make it really deep and you're still going to have plenty of air circulating. I typically will spray it down after I've done a bed with new landscaping, um, spray it all down and walk on it a bit just to settle it. But even that very first night, you can have an enormous rainstorm on a very, very, very large hill that your brother-in-law just paid all the money to do. And it still stays in place, no matter how much you feared through the night, through the storms, that it was all going to be at the bottom of the hill. So. <laughs> Sounds like it works. <laughs> it does. It really does. I mean, it's just they intertwine those pine needles together and they stay in place so much better than wood mulch does when there's a deluge coming down. So just give it a chance to settle in and help it by... Yeah spraying it down with water and walking on it when you first apply it. Thank you. All right. So a few questions on, um, you know, how to get started initially. Um, we have somebody on here who said that they had two wonderful or have two wonderful oak trees and there's barely any grass in between them. But, um, you know, what's the best way to start planting? planting underneath them. Another person was mentioning how they had some Pennsylvania sedge, but it got dug up by the squirrels. Um, so are there any tricks for that, you know, first, like if you're planting by seed um, or just, you know, starting out with bare, bare ground, any, any tricks or tips to well, ideally, we would start with seed instead of plugs, just because that's going to be the least intrusive to the tree itself. But some plants are much more difficult to start from seed than from plugs. Like Virginia bluebells, I do seed for those because it's so much easier. It may take it a few years before you really see the results. But I have personally a lot more success using the seed for Virginia bluebells than using the plugs because they just never seem to like being transplanted in my own experience. Um, and if it's something like pussy toes, that's a lot easier to just get some little tiny plugs of them, you know, put one here, one there. If it's something where you can't quite dig a big enough hole for it, but you can at least, you know, start down into the soil a bit. You can always mound up around that one plant if you need to with some extra soil to make sure it's deep enough without ending up covering all the root system of the tree. You can just kind of cheat on that one plant if you need to. Um, things like the jump seed are really, really easy to start from seed. Um, if you've got, especially if you've got a clear space where the grass is already not growing. There's so many things that will grow in shade, but turf grass is not one of them. Just start with the smallest plant you can handle and try to do from seed what you can do from seed. If you dig it in and get it into the soil in the spot that works, and then you can allow it to spread on its own, it'll do its own thing and you won't have to stress over it. Squirrels. <sighs> Squirrels. <laughs> We have in our yard probably 
I think over 21 oak trees and the squirrels. We have many millions of squirrels and they love to eat those juicy tender roots that you just planted. And I came to believe that they love those little plant tags because then they can identify what they're digging up and eating. And it shows them, hey, here's the newest one that I just planted because the tag is still in it. <laughs> um, I try building a little tiny barricade with that many oaks. We have a lot of branches on the ground too. So I break up, you know, some branches about 12 inches tall or so, and I stab them in the hole around the plant. And in sometimes that'll deter them enough to give the plant time to get its roots going. You know, most of these plants, if they eat the foliage, it's no big deal whatsoever. But it's when they literally reach through and just grab it up and munch the roots off that you just wish you were a hunter. But oh well. <laughs> no. We can't right. choose which nature we bring near, only, <laughs> only right. bring near. All right. Thank you. And Marianne wanted to know if you have any ideas or suggestions for companion plants with to go along with the golden current. Oh, gosh. Well, Virginia bluebells looks amazing because they bloom at the same time. So you've got that gorgeous blue and then the bright golden yellow. And just, I mean, golden currant, even if you can't see it, you can smell it. And it's just the most wonderful aroma, just spicy and yummy. Um, it's it's what spring should smell like, I think. So uh, the bluebells are really good to put with it. If you want something that blooms later, really any of the shade bloomers that you enjoy, whether it's the Pacara obaveda, the round leaf groundsel that stays real close to the ground. You could also do something as tall as jump seed around it if you liked something that's a little bit taller. So it, it really comes down to an aesthetic, but just about anything that'll grow in shade or partial shade would be just fine at the base of it. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. So, Pam's wanting to know if you can leave the grass around new a new tree planting or should you kill the grass within a three foot radius? Again, ideal and real. Mm -hmm. Ideally, we would have these soft landings as wide as the tree branches spread out. And that's at whatever age the tree might be. So when it's going to be a mature tree and it's going to be 30 feet across, ideally, we would have that big of a soft landing. In reality, many of us can't accommodate that kind of size. So ideally, when you're planting a new tree, I try to have at least a three foot, um, a three foot bed around it that, you know, in, even if it's only mulch, it's better than turf grass. Um, if you're not in a place where the aesthetic is very high-minded you can cut that turf cut the sod and just turn it upside down and let it die because once the roots are on top it will die and then it will decompose and just put those nutrients back into the soil it doesn't have to be a big hard thing to do that we kill ourselves making the the edges exactly in the right spot the best you can do is the best you can do and so ideally make it really, really large, but make it what you can handle. All right, thank you. A um, couple of questions coming in about leaf blowers. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, I think you, you mentioned this, but will you kind of reiterate uh, what impact leaf blowers can have on, uh, on your beneficial insects? Well, particularly when we're looking at the overwintering species, they, I mean, it's its literally a hurricane force wind. We see what it's doing to humans and buildings right now in Florida. That's what we're doing to the insect world when we use a leaf blower because it is that same force of wind. That's the gas leaf blower. Um, the electric or battery operated are a little less powerful typically, but again, you know, this, this creature has found a way somehow miraculously to have some leaves be enough for it to survive the winter here in our 
crazy weather and we're going to instead just blow it somewhere else and land where it may and see what happens and it's we have kind of a, a weird mentality about leaves in our society anymore i mean it's it's not necessary it never happened like that before does anybody remember being a kid and they would trudge through the wet leaves on halloween night when you were going trick-or-treating and you could smell the aroma of the leaves and the moisture and or you had one of those people in your neighborhood that had to burn their leaves in a barrel but it was the smell of fall and that was the beginning of the leaf obsession i think was the barrels mm -hmm. of burning leaves but it's just the, the the leaf blower thing, it's noise pollution, it's air pollution, because they sure do not have a catalytic converter on those suckers. And it's detrimental physically to the plants and the creatures that are surviving within that mess. So they're not my favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, duly noted. <laughs> the next question is, uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, what to do with the, from, this is from Carol, uh, with the 80 million acorns that are falling from her 80-year-old <laughs> oak tree? Well, last year was a mast year for us, so we had acorns everywhere. Uh, yeah, it's, I just let them be, and those are some of the things that I have to pull as weeds after a while. I usually let them grow for a year or so and feed the little leaf cutter bees because they love those little soft, tender leaves. And then I start pulling them or snipping them as I go through. But the ones that land in the lawn, they just get chopped up by the mower and the rest of them, you just kind of have to pull some seedlings sometimes. All right, thank you. Um, we just have... Three, about three more questions. So um, Kristen is wanting to know the first step for creating a bed if there are lots of invasive plants. Ugh, I'm so sorry. I'm so mm -hmm. sorry. But that's the first step is eliminating mm -hmm. the invasive plants. And mm -hmm. something to make sure you're aware of is that it's not a one and done thing because if it's invasive plants that have the propensity to have one teeny tiny little speck of a root, that will regrow or if it's one that has created a seed bank then those seeds will germinate in later years so it's something that you have to eliminate the majority and then deal with the the pop-ups as time goes on so it's not easy getting rid of invasives if it were then they wouldn't be invasive yes very true um and then do you have any Anything to add about sycamore leaves? Uh, Marcy was saying she has, are they any different than oak leaves per se um, in terms of that leaf matter? <laughs> well, we, we all know how enormous sycamore leaves are. They're so fascinating and cool. Um, it's not one I have experience dealing with in a landscape situation. If you are lucky enough to have an acreage situation, let them do their thing. Mother Nature's done it for eons. Um, that might be one that you might have to, at some point, deal with the leaves. It, I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but it's not one I have personal experience with, and I don't want to just blow smoke at you. So <laughs> good luck. <laughs> All right. And... Uh, one last question is that uh, Pam lost some Pecora obovata after mulching with oak leaves. Uh, these seem not to tolerate the leaf mulch. Has that been your experience? Um, I don't know that I've noticed a lot of it die back. I did have a client who had an extensive amount of it that was not there this year that was there last year and I don't think it was because of the leaves I really have noticed in general that a lot of plants were really 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 set back this year from at least in our area we had this wonderful warm-up too early 
and it lasted for several days. And then we had two separate incidents of hard freeze in the lower 20s after that warm up period. Um, like strawberries, I got no strawberries this year. So I think a lot of the spring plants were impacted in some way or another. I am not a scientist. I'm not, you know, one of the experts of the world on that, but that's my observation and my feeling from what I've seen um, going on this year. And I think it might be more weather related, but, you know, if it comes to it and the pecora outweighs the insects, then, you know, gently remove some of those leaves if that's what feels right to you. Um, a lot of times we develop that that sensation, that feeling of, well, this this really needs to be done, so I'm going to gently do it. And that's just part of gardening is trial and error. There's nothing that's 100% going to live, just like human beings. So, Very true. All right. Well, thank you so much, Paula. Uh, it was great hearing your presentation and um, hearing your uh, wonderful ideas for soft landing planting. So uh, as mentioned before, this webinar is being recorded and an email will be sent out tomorrow with the link to this webinar and the resources that Paula mentioned um, during her presentation. And if you enjoyed this presentation, please join us for our next webinar, which will be on September 13th. It is um, a Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar on the significance of Missouri's natural areas system with Mike Leahy. So again, thank you so much, Paula. It's great seeing you. And thanks everyone for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Haley.